Michael Morgan. Big round of applause. Let's start with the minute on. All right. Hey, Michael. Okay. Test, test, one, two, hello. Is that all right? Can you hear me? Yeah. Or is that better? Right, fine. Hello, my name is Robert Morgan and I'm a game writer and a narrative designer, whatever that is. And I now run the augmented reality theatre company Playlines and I'm the creative director, whatever that is. This is my last ever Video Brains, but it's also something like my eighth or ninth time speaking. Thank you for having ninth. me back. Ninth. You couldn't have made it an even ten, could you? Uh, I have to press the button twice, so if it looks like I'm getting out of sync with my slides, somebody just say something very rudely, announce it loudly to the entire class. Um, today, I want to talk about death. I've actually already done a talk called An Awfully Big Adventure, so this one is going to have to be called An Awfully Big Adventure 2, The Awfuling. Because death is the only certainty. And it's also one of the most consistent experiences that we have across video games. So much so that we often end up using it as our go-to word for failure, even when the game itself is theoretically at pains to tell us that's not exactly what's happening. But you could argue it's a form of desensitization to death. But even though death is a common feature in the narrative and the mechanics of games, it's also by definition kind of the most narratively incoherent element in a game's story, at least according to what you take as the conventional definition of narrative. If you die, you're supposed to be gone. Whatever your personal belief system is, whatever you think ontologically happens when we die, we do seem to know that people don't just flicker back, flicker out, and then come back in flashing and are invulnerable for a short time because we presumably conduct our lives rather differently. It's not that it doesn't happen in conventional narratives. By conventional, I mean films or books or anything else. But these usually conform to the idea that when a character is dead, their perspective is no longer available to us as viewers or readers. I'm discounting the undead here, as we all should, except on Halloween. If you haven't seen Psycho, then you may not know that the whole first hour or so of the movie follows a character who then gets just straight up ganked. And the narrative snaps to a new perspective character, in this case her sister. In fact. Hitchcock ran a whole anti-spoiler campaign for this movie, partly because of the big twist at the end, no spoilers, but also partly because of this twist halfway through. We haven't seen any other perspective up to the point when Janet Lee dies. So it's shocking because we're used conventionally, we're used to our protagonists having basically plot based invulnerability in order to protect our insight into the narrative. In order to keep open our window into the story, the protagonist has to stay alive or at least come back as a ghost or a zombie or something. But in this case, the perspective just moves to another character who we haven't met yet. A character who's going to face the same dangers. And we're almost kind of reluctant to get as closely engaged with this character because we got burned last time by the character who we thought was our avatar inside the story. And considering how much time we spend dying in games, or how much you do if you're me, anyway. Unsurprisingly, games spend a lot of time exploring how putting players through that weird, real, but not real experience of dying can make them feel. So today, I want to talk about five ways we die in games and how that makes us feel. And a little bit about what that says about how we play and how dying over and over, and if you're like me, over and over and over, helps us think about the real world. Now, this isn't about the design mechanics of dying so much. It's not about permadeath or having multiple lives or all of that. It's about the moment of passing over. The, how games decide to simulate something that we all, all get to experience, but usually only once, and that we don't typically get a chance to report back about. Now, this list isn't meant to be exhaustive. In fact, if you've died in a new and interesting way, then I want to hear about it at the end. So first, let's talk about loss of control. So very few games just smash cut to black when you die, because from a design perspective, that's pretty jarring to suddenly get a black screen and die. And because assuming that a game isn't one of those mythical Molyneux monoliths that deletes itself off your hard drive when you die, then in most cases, games want you to understand something about how you died to maybe equip you to do better next time, or to feel something more than just a cut off when you die, to motivate you to do something differently next time. 
One particularly common way of doing this, especially in action games and in military shooters, is a short sequence where you lose camera control, usually with like a red mist or a visual warp of some kind. Modern Warfare, among, modern warfare, among others, pioneered this idea of like a con continuous spectrum of visual warping, which reflects like injury and then severe injury and then near death and then death. But it's not a real continuity, it's still jarring, because you don't really slide continuously from injury to severe injury to near death to death, because the really important thing to the player is that moment when you lose control of the camera, when the camera control is wrested from you and the game takes over. That's effectively when you're in a death cut scene. The visuals might try and keep that moment when your body can't fight anymore separate from the moment when you die so that you spend a little bit of time looking up at the ceiling. But from the player's perspective, we still know the instant that we're done because it's the moment we lose full control. By and large, there isn't all that much difference between having 100% health and 1% health in a game, because you're still in with a shot, but there's a world of difference between 1% and 0%. Even if we're still looking through the character's eyes, even though they're, they're short, they're, they're still cutscenes, and so they're just as vulnerable to outstaying their welcome. As in any cutscene where you can't help doing something that you don't want to do, in this case dying, but I mean, more egregious examples exist, thanks to Dishonored. So, that's actually why making shooters in VR is a lot more difficult than you might imagine. So I've worked on action games in VR, and in one of them, Dying didn't present a particular problem. So this was Gunner, and it was a pretty straight up and down action arcade game, as the game suggests. You were in a fixed position in a classic New Hope style gun turret. And as you died, the screen read it out a bit, and then damage decals started appearing, and then after sufficient signposting, you'd just die. The screen would just fade out. This didn't actually present too many problems for players, because they understood exactly what was happening, and more importantly, we didn't ever take away camera control. But nonetheless, in another VR game I worked on, death became this really vexed issue. So in the assembly, death presented a much greater problem. So this was supposed to be a game with a strong feeling of threat and jeopardy. And in the end, you could almost never die. You could fall off a platform in one sequence, but you'd just fall into the dark below and then you'd reappear five steps back. And in testing, that turned out to be pretty discombobulating for the player. As a rule, in spite of trying to set up an atmosphere of danger, you were never in real threat. Because when you die in VR as a human, rather than as a fixed CCTV camera, you either have to smash cut to black, which is even more discombobulating for the player, or you have to take camera control away to stagger around a bit and die them to the floor with instant, often catastrophic nausea. When I was at PlayStation, we called this the nose bag problem because we thought we'd have to ship the damn things with nose bags attached to stop the vomit. So is there another way? Well, actually, the Rick and Morty VR experience found a pretty elegant way to do this, albeit one that wouldn't work with almost any other IP. So they wanted you to die from all sorts of things. And the moment you die, you're instantly transported somewhere in a dark room with a sign marked purgatory and a phone which allows you to respawn. This happens instantaneously. The moment you die, blank, you are just there. Now, not only is that relatively easy to engineer because teleporting you to a new location is a lot easier than taking control of the camera and performing an animation. It also preserved your camera control perfectly. You were just suddenly there. You figured out pretty quickly what had happened, so any discombobulation was part of the experience of blacking out and waking up instantaneously in purgatory. You look around suddenly and go, huh, but that gets folded into the story because that's exactly what you do. And you have complete control over when you respawn because you pick up the phone to do so. So respawning, which when you think about it, is an even more creepy experience than actually dying, is under your control. It's funny how much difference the being able to press the button yourself makes. For some reason, as players, we're able to put ourselves in the position of being a gun turret pretty easily, like in Gunner. And dying in that context, even in VR, didn't seem to cause us much more concern than, say, driving a remote control car under the wheels of a moving Humvee. But as soon as you give someone simulated legs to walk around on and simulated hands to look at, then you better be careful how you kill people in VR, because it turns out that once you get them inside a shell, humans are as stubborn as hermit crabs when it comes to getting them out again. 
This type of instant teleportation is pretty rare, and it's particularly well suited to this IP, so we probably won't see it used in the same way. But we might see similar sorts of mechanics cropping up in order to solve this problem in VR, as VR tries to give us experiences where death is meaningful, and where it's meant to feel affecting, and like it costs us something more than just a high score. Which brings me to another type of death we see now and then, which is particularly well suited to certain IPs. And in fact, you can argue certain IPs have been built from the ground up around this idea. And that's the idea that if the main character dies, then the story doesn't end. The storyteller just kind of got it wrong. And the best example of this is Assassin's Creed. So in the old days, the idea was that you, that is you, the modern day protagonist, Desmond, strapped into a big memory projection machine, you were living through someone else's memories. And there was this concept called synchronization that reflected how well you were acting out the way it really happened. So you don't ever actually die, you desynchronize, because the character that you're playing, 16th century Ezio, he didn't die then, so you must have got something wrong. So something similar happens in Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. There's this frame narrative of the prince recounting his adventures. And if you pop your clogs, he effectively just says, oh, no, wait, no, that's not how it went. Let me go back a bit. So that, along with the time reversal mechanic that comes with Sands of Time, means that if you keep dying, and you keep respawning, and he keeps having to start the story over at that point, it ends up sounding a bit like listening to your granddad tell the story of how he went to Shelbyville that one time, or even worse, like someone who's been caught telling porkies, desperately trying to account for how exactly they managed to get from A to C without visiting B. Oh no, I mean, I definitely, I kicked first, and then I stabbed him, and then I, oh, no, wait, uh, no, I stabbed him first, uh, and then I kicked him, and then I, no, wait. At first I hung back to observe his movements. Yeah, now I remember. Right. <clears throat> That's the problem with this approach. You bend and you contort your whole story concept to explain how the character can die, but not really die. Firstly, it's addressing a problem that most players don't even seem to have. Outside of VR, it doesn't seem to disrupt either our narrative immersion or our sensory immersion to die and come back again. But in the meantime, doing this to your story can make it feel like you're playing the game to try to find the way the game wants to be played. That you have control of the story, but only in the sense of fulfilling a story that's already been written. Or that you as player protagonist are trying to change your own shape to fit the space that's left for you in the story world. Now, that, according to the narratological theory, is how it would work, but you can take that too far. If you follow that conceit through to its logical conclusion, we are only acting out a predetermined story of someone else's memories, and dying is just a mistake we make along the way, but it usually doesn't feel like that, because even if the screen says desynchronize, then if I throw my controller at the wall in frustration, I'm likely to just say, oh, I died again. We seem happy to say, I died. I certainly do, over and over again. Fuck you, mini-mission with Danton in Assassin's Creed Unity. So it's not really a surprise that over time Ubisoft have stopped emphasizing this whole thing where you didn't really die. Because of course, it all makes sense if you've read the Assassin's Creed novels. But it turns out people don't really care. <laughs> now, making people care is always kind of the challenge. Can narrative elements in a game actually make people care about dying on an emotional basis and not just on a throwing the controller at the wall basis? Is being able to die always going to be gameplay significant, but insignificant in the story? Do you always step outside of the story the instant that you die? Well, one way some games have tried to address this is to let the story run for a little bit just after you die. So this is about having a scripted, specific narrative element which occurs after player death, and which then, it's gone. It's overwritten as soon as the new story starts, as soon as you respawn. Now the most classic of these, of course, is when you die in Metal Gear Solid. What's basically happening here is the game opens up a little temporary pocket dimension where we get to see what would happen after we died. The game's story gets to have its cake and eat it. Or, more accurately, the game story gets to attend its own funeral. The most obvious surface consequence of your death is that your friends are sad. 
your death feels significant because there are emotional consequences for those around you. The same thing's happening in an Uncharted game when you fling yourself off a cliff. You get to hear a brief snip of your companion seeing your death and reacting to it sadly or in a panicked way. Just those few seconds of post-mortem continuity. They give us this extra dimension in which we're not just failing the game or even failing ourselves, but we're failing our companions. And in fact, you can see Naughty Dog double down on this in Last of Us, where certain deaths trigger really unpleasant death sequences, which often focus not just on the consequences for Joel, but on Ellie's panicked reaction. Because it's usually extremely obvious that because we're no longer around, Ellie is almost certainly about to die. Because even these moments where she's reaching for you instead of getting out of there, very characteristically for Ellie, and I found myself thinking at the moment of death that if she just ran, she might get away. It's double the failure and double the emotional impact. There's emotional impact too when the Arkham series does this whenever you die. Dying results in this sort of taunt sequence where one of the villains gallery, or most embarrassingly of all, some unaffiliated thug, just appears and gloats over your dead body. They comment on how they can't believe they brought down the bat. They might even say, let's get that mask off. Things which are canonically speaking, next to impossible in Batman canon, although not if you know Batman comics, completely impossible because he seems to die all the time these days. But along with their often really obvious disbelief that they managed to kill you, there's this danger here that the message the game puts across is that what happens in this temporary pocket death dimension is impossible, or it would be impossible for the real Batman. So as a player, we failed not just the game or those around us, but we failed to be the Batman. In the same way that Wolfenstein's at pains to say, you're not just choosing different difficulties, you are being a different person when you play in different difficulties. Those sequences in Arkham can end up emphasizing the idea that you are role-playing as Batman only until you fail, because that's something that Batman doesn't do. And so not only do you step outside the story when you die, but that when the penguin cuts your mask off, maybe they won't find Bruce Wayne in there, but just some player in their living room. The games make a good, do a good job of making you feel like Batman if you're into that sort of thing. But maybe the narrative weight of Batman as reliable and largely failure-proof shows through that little crack that the game opens into a parallel world where you died. Now, lastly, games by definition have trouble making us feel like death is more than an inconvenience, big or small, perma or temporary. That's partly because the art of design is the art of managing convenience. And the gimmick of a game with true permanent death would just be that, a gimmick. A few games have tried to make deaths feel like true losses, and I just want to look at one example, though there are many others, quite a recent example, Battlefield 1. So, in the opening, you play through one of the more horrible battles of World War I. And you play through a sequence of must-lose, must-die encounters, which is usually absolutely death as a design point. But each one of these encounters corresponds to a different identity of a soldier on the battlefield. A different name appears on screen identifying who you are. There's a different set of arms that appear bouncing around in your field of view. When you die, as any of these people, the camera then zooms out to a map and zooms in again to a new person a new identity, an entire new life that's about to be lost. And every one of these deaths is a person, we're being told. And if they feel disposable and casually and indifferently thrown away, well, that's the Western Front for you. And in principle, I like this design point. I think it's clever. And I've had knockdown, drag out arguments about this design point, so I don't want to get into too much detail about it. But I don't think it goes far enough. And I think it undercuts its own point. Because these named deaths as named individuals are still tied to progress, just as much they are tied to the weight of each death. Because it turns out, if you go back and replay it, you can die in the wrong place and actually respawn, not as a new person, but as the previous one, in the same place with the same armament. They are must-lose battles, but even worse, it turns out they're must-lose battles where you have to get past a certain point and then lose, which is even worse. 
And I think that shows a lack of conviction. The game is more invested in making sure you die at a point where they can trigger the story cutscene than they are in following through on their own design logic. If every one of these deaths is a person, then that's more important to me than the cutscene they want to use to transition into the next part of the game. And maybe I don't get to see some lovingly made cinematic content. Or maybe it means that you could get through this sequence in seconds just by throwing grenades at the floor. But I think that's a fair price to pay for an ending that feels right and that feels like you've lost something. Now lastly, I want to say a word about the end of things. Because Video Brains has been pretty good to me. It helped me hone my speaking, which has been a real difference in my career, and believe me, there's nothing that will knock the corners off your thought and your practice and your speaking and make you more professional and force you to be better than having to do brand new thinking every month, having to ask, hopefully, new questions every month, and having to come up with a raft of new puns month after month in the face of unappreciative and often violently hostile audiences, month in, month out. I can't say for sure that my career would be different without Video Brains, but it feels like it, and it feels like it would be poorer. In the last year, I've been setting up my own small studio to do the art that I really care about, and I've found it a probably unnecessarily stressful and intimidating process. But I'm pretty sure that the practice I got here and the friends that I made here helped. And now Video Brains is ending or semi-ending, or its era is ending. So it seemed weirdly fitting to talk about when things end in games, but they keep going anyway, because the vast majority of games teach us to keep going even when we die. Sometimes we could keep going stronger and wiser. Sometimes we keep going feeling a bit foolish. Sometimes we're screaming in frustration. But it doesn't matter whether we can spawn right back into the action, or whether we throw the controller aside and walk away from a game for months. Games let us try again, and keep trying. And I think that's kind of inspiring, and worth talking about here at the end of something that's meant a lot to me, and that I know has meant a lot to a lot of other people here. Now, yeah, you can argue that being able to die over and over, and start over and over in games, dilutes or devalues or desensitizes games' ability to talk about death, real death. But I think that because games teach us to persevere, when, and to take risks, and to manage risks, and to make our own choices, even deciding when death is too high a price to go back to that bloody checkpoint yet again. That because of that, when we step outside the game, when we're back in the, this world here, where thanks to some monstrous comic injustice or in-joke, we only get one shot at life, I think games make us a bit better prepared to decide what kind of life we want to live and to keep pushing for it, no matter how bad the curve is, no matter how unfair the checkpointing seems. Video Brains has meant a lot to a lot of people, and a lot of people worked incredibly hard to make it and to keep it going in the face of the inevitable difficulties of anything that's worth doing. The inevitable amount of frustrations and disappointments and the long nights and the difficult phone calls and the little failures that you've got to keep running into, you've got to keep hurling against just to keep something like this going. Because here in the real world, failure isn't something that just happens like a bulb going out any more than success is just achieved, like a switch flipping on. Failure is a spectrum you wake up and you find yourself on every single day, just like everybody else, no matter how successful you may seem to others. Every day you wake up somewhere on that spectrum, and every day, some days it doesn't seem like you've got much to show for it. Every day, though, you have to decide what you're going to do about it. When you're making something, or trying to make something happen, or keeping something going, the temptation to just let this one be a failure too far, to give up, that temptation keeps getting greater and greater. But Video Brains might be ending, but it's the furthest thing from failing. Because it was kept going in the face of failure and frustration by people who muscled it together out of nothing, and who thought it was worth doing. People who thought it would mean something, and today I want to say, yeah, guys, it did. And if you're out there trying to make something, or dreaming of making something, then I want to tell you that it's the failures that you get past by hook or by crook or by glitch, or sometimes just by handing the controller off to somebody else so they can get you past just that one bit. The failures that you've got past, that's what matters. Not the one that finally gets you, for whatever reason. 
Because the failures that you got past along the way, every single day, that's what things are actually made of. I'm going to miss this. It brought something really great to the London scene, something that was missing, and something that will be missed. But it leaves the London scene changed for the better, so they'll be able to make something even better in the future. And if you're here now, or if you were here at the beginning, I want to tell you that you were part of something that was hard to make, but that was worth it, and to keep that with you. Video Brains is dead. Long live Video Brains. And that's where I want to end it. Thank you very much.